Hello, welcome to the House of Wellness. It is brilliant to be here, as always, alongside the one and only Joe Stanley, Jackie Felgate, Dr Nick Carr. Good to see you guys. Hi, nice. It's lovely to be here. And we have covered some ground over the last couple of episodes, so we are well and truly getting our steps up. And as a doctor, it's music to my ears, Joe, because it's been shown that just walking briskly for 11 minutes a day is a key way of reducing your risk of early death. Well, they say 30 minutes of moderate exercise daily is optimal, but now it's only 75 minutes for a whole week. But without blowing our trumpet, I feel like we're all pretty fit here and we'd like to do at least the 30 minutes a day. Well, you'll be pleased to know, Jack, that it now has actually been scientifically proven because there's been a huge study out of the UK, data collected from over 30 million people, which showed that brisk walking, just 11 minutes daily, and it has to be every day, reduced the risk of sudden death by up to a quarter. That's a compelling stat you know, when you think about it. I think most of us understand some consistent exercise, getting your body moving is really good for our health, but I'm not sure everyone still grasps how important sleep is. And when you think about uh, daylight savings, the first Sunday oh. of April, that's this weekend, good time to think about more sleep. I absolutely love that extra hour. But am I the only one that still has to say to herself, it's spring forward, fall back, to remember which way the clock goes? I feel like I haven't slept in years because I've got young kids and they get up at 5.30 no matter what. <laughs> well, the average amount of sleep that an adult needs is seven to nine hours. But anyone who gets regularly less than about five hours sleep is risking long-term health problems problems. So really important to get those Zs up. I'm not sure about you. I'm a subscriber to if you get those extra few hours in before midnight, mm. genuinely feel like it's worth double in my estimation. You subscribe to that, Nick? Yeah, I think that's true. And we need to remember that sleep changes through the life cycle. So babies, of course, need a huge amount, up to 18 hours. And teenagers, Das, they need a bit more than us, about 10 hours. But one of the most interesting misconceptions about sleep is the role of melatonin and how it encourages sleep. A French astronomer in the 18th century put a plant in a dark cupboard and watched it. And the plant in the dark cupboard opened its leaves at the same time as the plant exposed to sunlight and then closed its leaves when it was dark at night. And from that, there's this whole concept that every living organism has a body clock or a clock mechanism of some description. We live in a 24-hour environment, but we have a body clock of 24 hours and 6 to 20 minutes. So each day we need to reset our body clock so it matches up as closely as possible to the environment in which we live. When we are exposed to light, then melatonin, our sleep hormone, is suppressed. When we have long periods of darkness, as they do in Scandinavia and other northern European countries, then you often don't get enough melatonin at the right times. And most people believe that it's about making us sleepy, but that's actually a secondary component of melatonin. The primary effect of melatonin is to drop your body temperature. So you can't go to sleep or fall asleep and stay asleep unless you have melatonin being secreted. And that is in response to either light or dark. What we want most from sleep is we don't want to think we don't want to feel, we don't want to be responsible. We want time out. And when we don't get those things, when it's really difficult for us to go to sleep at night, if you've got a delay in your body clock, such as delayed sleep-wake phase disorder, your sleep-wake cycle can be an hour longer than everybody else's. So you're like permanently jet-lagged. But really the most important thing is that you have a, a sort of fairly constant getting up time because our body temperature is at its lowest point two hours before you wake. So you want light exposure after that. And if you have light exposure after that time, you will shorten your sleep-wake cycle and it will match up with your environment better. So the two things that are really important about our sleep is being up for a number of hours, which gives you a, a sleep debt or you have sleep pressure, and it needs to be at the right time of the circadian rhythm of the 24 hour period that you can go to sleep. So those two things need to match up for good sleep. And it takes a lot of practice to put things into the background. It's all about saying, if I keep holding on to this, worrying about this, planning for the next day, you're then telling a part of the brain that there's danger. So your brain will keep you awake because if your brain has to choose between survival and sleep, it's not gonna choose sleep. 
I often say to my wife, Beck, I'm a good sleeper, Joe, because I've got a clear conscience. Right. She says, perhaps, maybe you don't have a conscience, At and that's all. why you sleep so well. <laughs> How about you, Jackie? Are you a good sleeper? I'm a shocking sleeper, but I'm also a really light sleeper. And my husband just turns over, and that's it. It's on. Or off. <laughs> What's on? Nothing. He's out of the He's bed out. and has okay. to sleep in the spare room. <laughs> well, have you heard, actually, the latest buzzword when it comes to sleep is social jet lag, which is where you throw your body out of whack from sleeping in because of the late nights that you've had partying, which is clearly a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it is true, Joe, because if we mess with our circadian rhythms over the long term, disassociated with chronic health problems. So we recommend if you're going to sleep in at the weekend, do it on a Saturday, and then Sunday, maybe get up near your regular work time. And is that why on a Monday, if you've been out, we always feel so groggy and tired? That's uh, one of the reasons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am a bit of a fan of trying to get to sleep at a similar time and getting up consistently at the same time, as Professor Bartlett explained a little bit earlier. Yeah, I'm with you, Darcy. That's what I do as well. But I'm also a fan of doing some home cooking just to move sideways. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things I love is getting some fresh herbs from the garden at the moment. I'm riddled with basil everywhere in the garden, so it's anything with tomatoes. Really? Oh, God, riddled. you're so smug about it too. <laughs> I'm so jealous that you're able to grow a thriving garden. I can't keep a single thing alive. I'm very jealous you have this thriving garden. But, you know, the cost of living recently has had a lot of people creating their veggie patches at home, growing their own produce. And, you know, it's really lovely because... There are so many different options, no matter how small your space. You've got portable herb gardens, you've got veggie pods, lots of different ways that you can get your hands dirty and grow your greens. I'm Reese Carter, naturopath, nutritionist and total herb nerd. I'm going to teach you everything I know about herbs, from growing them to using them in food, as well as some of their traditional therapeutic uses. Even if you've never grown them before, you're probably going to recognise these two herbs. They're two of my favourite culinary herbs. We've got flat leaf parsley and we've got basil over here. They're actually super easy to grow, so even if you think you're a black thumb, give it a go. They both want a lot of light, like most herbs do. You'll also want to water them quite regularly and the only difference, really, is that basil's going to need a little bit more enrichment in the soil. Parsley will be a bit more forgiving in that regard. But the number one tip I would have, if you're starting a herb garden for the first time, is just make sure you're finding a spot that gets six to eight hours of sunlight most days. Another great herb to grow in the garden is mint. Cultures all around the world have used mint as a digestive aid, and it's believed to be the oils in the leaves that may contribute to that effect. Now, peppermint is best, but any mint will do in a pinch, and you can just grab a handful of the leaves, chop it up into a fresh leaf tummy tea, and enjoy. And the best part, it is so easy to grow. In fact, you'll probably need to rein it in, if anything. I love to grow it in pots or containers because left unchecked, it will send these runners out all over your garden and just take over. Unlike the other herbs we've looked at in the garden today, rosemary does not require much water at all. In fact, it only wants to be watered once, maybe twice a week, and it needs a really free-draining soil to help pull that water away so it doesn't get waterlogged. Apart from that, plenty of sunshine, and that will make sure that it develops the essential oil so it smells the way that rosemary is meant to smell and tastes the way it's meant to taste. Whether we're using it on our lamb dishes, whether it's with roast potatoes, or my favourite, with mushrooms. We've also got lavender, which you may not think of as a herb, but it's been used in a lot of traditional remedies for stress and relaxation and for sleep. The easiest way to kind of use it at home, firstly, grow it in a very similar way to the way you would grow rosemary. They have very similar needs and grow beautifully together. And then come out, pick off a few flower heads. You can either crush them and pop them underneath your pillow slip so that you can smell that beautiful lavender smell, or pop them straight into a tea. They don't have to be dry, they can be fresh. And I've actually spied another herb over here in the garden that works beautifully as a fresh leaf tea with the lavender for stress and sleep. Tucked away over here in the corner is lemon balm. And it's one of my favourites. If you like a sleepy tea at night, but you don't love the floral taste of chamomile, lemon balm is for you. It works really well in a fresh leaf tea. Grab a handful, chop it up and steep it in boiling water. And it combines really, really well with lavender. I do love the idea of having a grocery store in my backyard, but it's just not going to happen for me, unfortunately. I'm actually renting at the moment and I want to go down to the hardware store and buy one of those little portable ones and you get the kids involved too. It's such a great thing for them to do. It's never too late to start planting, Jack, but it's fair to say you'll have a long wait to catch up with this old-timer, which is thought to be the oldest living non-clonal tree. Non-clonal meaning that the trunk is the same age as the root system. It's a Patagonian cypress growing in Chile and it is 5,400 years old. Isn't that amazing? 
amazing. It is, and it means that it sprouted at the end of the Stone Age, which is crazy. It's literally a living record of the past. I think I can confidently say none of us are going to live for 5,000 years. No. <laughs> However, we can all understand that getting good sleep is a really surefire way to prolong your life. Up next, a breakthrough story helping kids on the spectrum sleep soundly. Tell you all about it next on the House of Wellness. Dr Nick, is it true that we spend around a third of our lives or 26 years asleep? It's extraordinary, isn't it, Jack? Mm. And add to that another seven years that we spend trying to get to sleep and the total is 33 years of our lives involved in sleep. Well, if you're a parent like me, you never sleep because your kids never sleep. But I was surprised to learn that one in ten children actually snore. Yeah, so snoring and, more importantly, the sleep apnea, where breathing actually stops, keeps everyone awake. And the traditional treatment for snoring mm. for kids was surgery, taking out tonsils and adenoids and, later, steroid sprays. But now... Aussie ingenuity has struck again. That's right. The Murdoch Children's Research Institute has looked into this one and found that a simple salt water nasal spray can actually be really effective and could potentially limit the number of surgeries every year. Yeah, and I was amazed and absolutely delighted by this study, Jack, because we've used saline sprays for years, but now we know that this simple, safe, cheap treatment can actually reduce the need for tonsillectomy by half, and anything that reduces surgery in kids has to be good. And there's also been some interesting research into children on the spectrum in sleep. Yes, I mean, a whopping 50 to 80% of kids on the autism spectrum have sleep problems, and that's put stress on the whole family. Melbourne's Monash University is also looking into this, conducting the biggest study of its kind into children on the spectrum so everybody can get a better night's sleep. Is your character Alex? <laughs> My daughter Chloe is 11. She was diagnosed with autism at age five, but we have had sleep difficulties essentially from the day that she was born. Her brain never stops, so she has a lot of trouble switching that brain off. She doesn't nap ever, so I always thought that was a natural thing, but I'm starting to realise it's more a skill that needs to be learned, so napping is not something that can be done to help her if she doesn't have her sleep. With Chloe not sleeping, I didn't sleep. And then I spent all this time wondering, am I overreacting? Is it me? What am I doing wrong? I'm a terrible parent. My poor child isn't sleeping. What am I doing? But when you're so sleep deprived yourself and you have no resources to support you, it becomes isolating and you feel like you can't talk to anybody else about it because you feel like you're being judged. Over many years of restless nights, Melbourne's Andrea Painter has gradually developed an effective sleep routine for her daughter, Chloe. But according to Professor of Child Psychology, Nicole Reinhardt, an enormous number of Australian kids are experiencing similar challenges at bedtime. Up to 80% of autistic children will experience sleep difficulties and it has an enormous impact, not just on the young person and their development, but also on the wider family system. It causes a lot of stress for parents. This common problem was the subject of a major study conducted by Monash University's Krongold Clinic, in which paediatricians and psychologists consulted over 240 families with autistic children. So the Sleeping Sound study is a very brief behavioural intervention. It involves two sessions and then a follow-up consultation for the parent and for the child. In the first session, we take a really detailed history to understand what the specific difficulty is. And then we talk about various options that could be personalised to the young person. And then in the second session, we implement those strategies and then we follow up to see how things went. The key finding was that children's sleep improved, so that's fantastic. But we also found that there was improvements in children's emotional and behavioural functioning. And we found a reduction in parents' stress. So it's more, this sleep intervention was more than sleep. It had a systemic positive effect on the young person and their family. While the results of this study clearly show the value of a personalised approach, Researchers also identified a number of strategies that families found particularly effective. We sometimes put in place something called a bedtime pass. It's where a, a little cardboard pass is made and it says you can get out of bed basically once during the night. And if they're able to manage that, then in the morning they're going to get a reward. 
but where children are still persistently thinking and worrying and reporting worries at night time, one of the strategies is to write it down, pop it in a jar, pop it in an envelope. So somehow to move that worry from the child's um, thinking and put it somewhere to come back to tomorrow. Um, so those simple interventions for managing anxiety we found to be really helpful for young people. With a second trial now underway via telehealth, researchers are hoping this study will result in effective sleep interventions becoming more accessible allowing families all over Australia to get a better night's sleep. When children are babies and infants and they don't sleep, you can go to a sleep school. There's nurses and medical professionals to help you. When you have a child that doesn't sleep, there isn't anyone. Everybody has ideas and suggestions, but there isn't actually anybody there to help you. So if I'd had a psychologist that could have maybe given me a telehealth once or twice to talk me through what I needed to do, to help Chloe to get into a better routine that could touch base with me after trying it for two weeks and say, how is this going? Have you, you know, tell me the things that are working, tell me the things that aren't working. That would have just been game changing. That would have reduced our stress and just helped us to help Chloe immensely. It just would have been absolutely life altering to have that kind of support available. It's really important that kids on the spectrum get this kind of help, especially when they're home and feel safe. And it's not hard, Jack, because it's just some basic, sensible behavioural principles. The Sleeping Sound Initiative is looking for more volunteers to take part, and you can do so until May 1. But, Dr Nick, I really want your tips. I need them for a good night's sleep. <laughs> well, sleep is a habit, Jack, and habit loves a routine. Now, mine is very simple. It's shower, read until sleepy, then lights out. OK, well, speaking of good health and good sleep, Heinze's journey to good health is continuing this week. He's gone to a super quiet room to take a big breath of air. Oxygen is our lifeline. And when it comes to injury or even post-workout recovery, our body needs to replenish the oxygen in our bloodstream. That's how we get our strength back. Deep, heavy breathing is one way to get the oxygen flowing, but some people swear by the benefits of getting an extra hit by harnessing the power of both oxygen and pressure. So we'll get you in. OK, so there's a oxygen mask. So we'll put the oxygen mask on once you're in. Yep. Mate, I feel like I'm about to head on a space expedition. Yep. This is about as close to a space capsule as you're going to get. OK. Jack, in its simplest terms, what is hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is really the use of oxygen under pressure. So we put you in the capsule, that has 95% oxygen, but what we do is we put pressure in the system. That pressure then pushes more oxygen into your bloodstream, and that can then be used for energy production, healing and recovery. And when you're in there, you can speak to us through the phone, and if you need to get our attention, you just press this button here, and we'll be able to hear that wherever we are. Yeah. Run me through some of the key benefits of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So the key benefits are, as we bring more oxygen into the system, that helps with our energy production. We get a lot of people saying they get a bit more mental acuity, because they've got that more oxygen. People will breathe easier, and you'll get, for people who have got injuries, they'll get a lot better recovery on their soft tissue injury just because you get more oxygen into the area because when you've got a soft tissue injury, you tend to have uh, restricted blood flow. They're just having more oxygen in the bloodstream will just help that recovery because that's really what oxygen helps you do. Um, just watch your elbow and we'll close this one up. I would definitely say that I resonate as someone who does have claustrophobia. So when it comes to the door closing and me not being able to open it myself, what advice do you have? Uh, the advice I'd have is just surrender, just accept that you are going to have this experience. I think the best thing to do, like always when you're trying to reduce your stress level, is breathe deeply. Yep. There's lots of oxygen, so you'll actually yeah. feel quite good when you breathe uh, deeply. One of the things I like to do, because some days I feel better than others in there, um, I just close my eyes so I can't see what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Can the experience be uncomfortable? We talk about the ears potentially popping. Yep. What else goes on for the actual person in there? Yeah, it is different for everybody. As the pressure equalises, that pressure in your ears goes away. What we tend to find then, 
people kind of cosy into it. You can't bring your phone in, so you tend to have a time, maybe a bit of screen time out for the day. People tend to relax, and then quite often we find them having a nap towards the end of the session. That was a roller coaster, and I mean it in so many wonderful ways because it challenged me personally at first. I thought I'd be knocking on the glass saying, get me out of here. For anyone who is considering giving this a go, I cannot recommend it enough because even if you're nervous about the space, you'll be really proud of yourself for getting over that initial hurdle. And then when you lean into the benefits, you're gonna feel so good. Mental health, physical health, oxygenated, really inspired. I have a feeling I'm gonna have a very pumped up day. <laughs> Heinzy there getting a big old dose of O2 into his blood. Now, Das, we're talking sleep today, so I have a question for you. Dennis the Staffy, is he allowed to sleep in your bed? Absolutely 100% not until <laughs> I get out and then he's in there every single time, sitting right next to Beck in my spot, which <laughs> clearly I'm unhappy about, uh, Joe. It happens every time I'm out. He just, just works his way in there. Did you know a recent survey found that 65% of Aussie dogs are uh, sleeping in their owner's bedroom. 73% actually get on the bed. And how about 53% are under the sheets, Joe? Oh, That's too much, sheets, isn't it? The sheets, too far. Well, there are pros and cons, Das. I mean, the pros being it can be really good for your anxiety, right? And I find it makes me more anxious having him in the bed. Well, that's probably because he, he's trying to push you out. 100% he is. <laughs> yes. And the cons being, well, the hair, the smell, the dirt. And actually, dogs are very active during the night, so they can disturb your sleep. Particularly if it's Dennis who's literally kicking you <laughs> out. Do you know the Queen used to sleep with her corgis at the base of her bed, Joe? So I suppose if it's good enough for the Queen, good enough for us. Yeah. <laughs> I think we've been a bit slow on the uptake, but it feels like all of us as a society in general are doing a much better job at celebrating diversity and making life more inclusive for everyone. Would you agree, Nick? Well, you're right, Dars, because the UK has just produced the first TV quiz show, particularly for deaf people. And traditionally, the buzzers and so on have meant that quiz shows were out of reach for deaf people, but they've just produced this new show, Sign to Win, which is entirely in sign language. How good is that? And a little closer to home, two Victorian music festivals have just become more inclusive. The Meredith and Golden Plains festivals have introduced no strobe light stages, so people who suffer seizures can attend. It's one of those, I can't believe they didn't think of it before ideas. Yes, and I love this, you know, that kind of great step yeah. forward is being seen in fashion as well. There's a move to design clothes with inbuilt solutions for people with disabilities, combining style with self-empowerment. <laughs> It was 2005 when Brisbane's Lisa Cox caught a rare form of Streptococcus A, leading to a brain hemorrhage that resulted in over a dozen operations and procedures. I didn't have a disability for the first 24 years of my life, but as soon as I became disabled, I suddenly had to dress very differently. So I now have a prosthetic leg. I'm permanently seated in my wheelchair and I can no longer drop buttons because I'm missing my fingertips. But that didn't mean that fashion was no longer required. And people sometimes wrongly make the assumption that once you acquire a disability or when you have a disability that all sense of fashion is not required and nothing could be further from the truth because people with a disability still want to look good. Despite one in five Australians having some form of disability, until recently, this entire community had been completely excluded by designer fashion labels. But according to leading fashion commentator, Glenis Trail-Nash, that's finally beginning to change, thanks to the rapidly growing market of adaptive fashion. So adaptive fashion caters specifically to people with disabilities and when you think about that, perhaps the first thing that comes to your mind is people in wheelchairs, people with prosthetics, and it is that, but it's also even things like autism where people have sensory issues and the skin is super, super hypersensitive to fabrics and the feel of fabrics. So it, it, it is a very wide-ranging term and increasingly it's getting a lot of interest. 
The global adaptive fashion market is expected to hit 400 billion by 2026 or 27. And the things I've read suggest that Australia has like 1.5% of that. That's still, that's still a big number to get, to tap into. One of the most popular Australian brands tapping into this market is Christina Stevens, a label founded by Queenslander Jessie Sadler. So I became interested in the adaptive fashion space about seven years ago after my mum had a fall and damaged her arms. Dressing was difficult for her, it was painful. Uh, she was unable to move her arms freely. Um, so as you can imagine, getting dressed in a shirt or a dress um, would be difficult. And the other challenge we were experiencing was that what was available out there looked like a hospital gown, it was unisex, it was one size fits all, and um, that, that's not up my mum's alley. I think so it would be a bit more edgy if we had... To go off a bit to the side. Yeah. Jessie's side, business yeah. partner is Carol Taylor, who is proud to call herself the world's first quadriplegic <laughs> designer. Lilac. Yay! You know, my love of fashion didn't change after my spinal cord injury. I loved it before, I loved it just as much after. However, I found myself immediately excluded from the fashion conversation. And um, that immediately meant that shopping became a very lonely experience and in fact really impacted my PTSD and depression during a time that I was already having to adjust to so much. Your beautiful artwork has printed out beautifully. For generations we've had able-bodied people designing for people with disability and there's just no, there's just no comparison to lived experience of disability. You can't, you don't realise what a bank of knowledge, I didn't realise what a bank of knowledge 20 years in a chair has given me uh, until you start problem solving. But aesthetically, mm. I, I agree, it doesn't look great. So fashion does so much more than just, you know, cover us up and keep us warm. It goes to one's core sense of identity, to your sense of self. It affects one's confidence. But most importantly, it has a direct impact on the way the world perceives you. Last year, this movement finally stepped into the spotlight at Australian Fashion Week, where Christina Stevens' designs were featured in the festival's first ever adaptive fashion runway. We had overwhelming success. We had a standing ovation at the end, which was beautiful. Uh, we had probably the largest media coverage of the week. It was a great feeling being out there along with everybody else with a disability in Carol's design. It was an important step obviously a long way to go, but it was one piece of the jigsaw to move the conversation forward in terms of the representation of disability in the, the bigger picture of, of popular culture. So you've got Tommy Hilfiger, you've got Nike, um, a number of international brands, Target in the US, for example, Zappos, who are now adding a category to what they already deliver to people. I think when you get those big brands doing it, I think then that's when the real shift starts happening because that's when you get that real recognition, that broader recognition and other brands go, well, maybe we should be playing in this space as well. We feel very strongly that people with disabilities should have access to the same retail therapy experience as everyone else. And I think that in that respect, adaptive clothing is where plus size clothing was 15 years ago. We're on the precipice of revolution. Being able to dress yourself, being able to be independent with your fashion choices and being able to just get out of bed, choose what you want to wear and put those clothes on independently as an adult is a game changer. It sounds so simple, but it really is a big deal. Still on innovation, there's a movement called frugal science, which means making quality goods cheaply, not necessarily for profit, which allows science to flourish worldwide. And a couple of clever cookies from Stanford yeah. University have done exactly that. Yes, it's called a fold scope, and it's a portable microscope made entirely from cardboard and costs less than $2 <laughs> to make, which is amazing. It's pretty incredible, Jack. And it's being used globally to test for malaria, which remains a huge killer around the world. And, of course, traditional heavy 
expensive microscopes, often not available in the developing world. So this is a massive development. Well, Nick, from innovation to sustainability, our own Jade Kisnorbo is going global to find the latest in ethical beauty, next on The House of Wellness. It is important to be ethically aware and environmentally conscious and to minimise waste, but it's great to see that cosmetics companies are getting on board too. Yeah, absolutely. It's all about being informed and aware, Jack. And how's this for an education campaign? In Bolivia, mm. a group of musicians held a free rock concert overlooking a city dump with instruments made from recycled garbage. I love that. It's pretty amazing and it's all about teaching the locals to become more environmentally aware and sustainable. Um, whatever those instruments are though, they look amazing. Well of course the global movement to minimise waste has hit the beauty industry. So at one of the world's biggest beauty expos, Jade Kay went on a mission to seek out sustainability and the latest trends in colours and cosmetics. Sustainability is something that we should all care about and it really has been a theme here at Cosmoprof Asia. So it's no surprise at all that it's taking place in the greenest, cleanest city in the world, Singapore. Welcome everybody. So, sustainability and innovation. Uh, it's a big topic, obviously, today, sustainability. It's not even a trend. It's something that we all have to do. We have to become more sustainable. With over 15 years in the beauty industry, Eva Lagarde helps beauty brands develop sustainable products. She also supports professionals like me to make more informed decisions. Eva, in the past, do you think that the beauty industry has had a negative reputation when it comes to sustainability? Or is that changing? Yeah, I think actually beauty industry wasn't really thinking about sustainability and the brands, but not the consumers. It was both on both ends of the spectrum. So I don't think he had a bad reputation. I think he had no reputation when it yeah. came to sustainability. There's no small steps when it comes to being sustainable. Everybody has to work uh, on their side. Just to give you a bit of an example, when we do uh, an assessment of the cost of emission for a, a beauty product, the most uh, carbon emission is coming from the consumer side. So it means that even if the beauty brands are making a lot of efforts to make their product better and less uh, costly for the environment, down the line, the consumer has to make a lot of effort as well. So it's all of us working together. And I love that. I love the fact that it's not just on the beauty brands to take that responsibility. It's also us who are purchasing it. Luckily, there's plenty of exhibitors at Cosmoprof making it easy for us to reduce our impact on the planet. Wow, refillable mascara. Refillable is the easiest way to reduce the amount of waste. If that's not innovation and sustainability, I don't know what is. Mascara is just one beauty product undergoing a sustainability glow up. Makeup brushes held together without glue allows for disassembling and recycling the individual parts. This means less waste and ultimately more fun as the handles are completely customizable. False lashes are also going green. These lashes all come from a natural-based uh, material. So, for example, for the lashes itself, they are made from a plant-based fiber. We are using recycled paper for the packaging. So I can say that this is the first whole package lashes that is 100% biodegradable. One of the keys to a sustainable future is advancements in technology, which beauty journalist Amanda Lim knows too well. Amanda, technology has impacted everyone. So what does the future of beauty look like as tech evolves? What I hope it will happen is there will be more e efficacy. So let's just say you have a, for example, you have a cleansing device that can cleanse your face and uh, massage it at the same time. Or you can also have like an AI quiz or a skin analysis tool. Can all this technology give us more accuracy in helping us pick products? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because, like, you just imagine if you are someone who's suffering from acne, you're suffering from eczema, and you try 10 products that yeah. don't work. So what, what does that happen? You throw away the product, you use halfway, or you get frustrated and you can't find the right product. So hopefully with technology, the consumers are happier because they can find uh, the right product for themselves. 
And another thing is that it will stop wastage. If you really want true sustainability, we have to talk about reducing the amount of products that we use, reducing the product that we buy. I know it's not really um, it's popular it's to say. Hard. Yeah, but it's about reducing and reusing. We don't talk about the other two hours enough. Because I can tell you, I'm surrounded by all this all day and I've never used less beauty products. I know I waste so much cotton buds. I know I waste so much makeup removers in terms of pads. Things like that I've never really thought about again. And I thought, oh, you know, in my kit, we have to have it for hygiene reasons. Waste for me is where I'm going to start making some changes. Whether we're looking to de-stress, gain restful sleep, or restore our gut biome, natural remedies have existed for thousands of years. But something has happened along the way. Packaging natural herbs into tightly packed pills to support the modern manufacturing processes can mean the use of completely avoidable fillers and additives. And if they're gonna make their way into the pill, they can make their way into your body. Some supplements can contain up to 20 completely avoidable ingredients. These can include benzoates, magnesium stearate, animal products, polyethylene glycol, just to name a few. It can be tricky to tell which products contain these unwanted ingredients because in Australia, supplements are regulated as medicines, so you don't have to have the full ingredient list on their label. Choose a brand that's willing to be transparent with their ingredients. Some cleaner options can include liquid herbal extracts or veggie capsules that use traditional methods with minimal processing. Natural remedies can help us live an intentionally mindful and balanced life. And knowing what's really in our supplements may help keep unwanted ingredients out of our bodies. Well, Joe, today has been all about sleep. Are we getting enough sleep? Is it good quality sleep? How do we sleep for better? Now, one thing I try to do is eat early. I don't like eating just before I go to bed. I find that makes me a little bit uh, uncomfortable. Well, the jury's out on bananas, with some experts saying that they're full of magnesium, which is going to help you sleep, but other experts say that the energy spiking carbs in bananas are actually going to mean that you don't sleep so well. So... And the one that I hear a lot about is that people, if you eat cheese before you go to bed, you tend to have nightmares. Have you experienced that? <laughs> Certainly the person you're sleeping with will. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah. I've got the giggles now. <laughs> um, but sleep, like anything, is affected by what we eat. So here is Heinze and Zoe with a little something to settle your tummy and rest your digestion. Our bodies are amazing, Zoe. While we're here in the kitchen whipping up some delicious recipes that are good for our gut health, we have one to two kilos of bacteria just sitting here, waiting, ready to respond to what we whip up. It's actually heavier than the total weight of our brain. Crazy, I know. But you know what? Bacteria sometimes get a little bit of a bad rap, but in the gut, there's good and bad, and they exist in equilibrium to support our digestive and immune system health. And it's up to us to make sure that the good bacteria limits the space for the bad bacteria to grow. And one way is through food, and we've got the same hero ingredient today, yogurt. We've actually got two different types. I'm using Greek yogurt, and you're using Icelandic ski yogurt. Let the yogurt Olympics begin. <laughs> Everyone's a winner, Luke, because both are rich in probiotics to add good bacteria to support the gut microbiome. Yeah, but the skier yogurt's actually higher in protein, <laughs> so I'm kind of ready to take out the gold medal. Look, sadly, we can't just rely on diet alone. Antibiotics, while effective in treating illness, may actually have a negative impact on our gut, reducing the number of good bacteria. And an uneven balance in favour of bad bacteria doesn't look or feel good. I'm talking digestive upsets like gas, bloating, stomach cramps, constipation and diarrhoea. Thanks for that mental image, Lukey. But fortunately, there is something that we can do. Eating probiotic-rich foods and exploring probiotics in supplement form. Look for a high-strain probiotic range that can be taken during or after antibiotic use to help restore the friendly gut bacteria. Mm, thanks, Lukey. Now, I'm excited to think, what other foods can we compete Olympic style? Oh, I'm thinking I'm going to go with onion rings. Oh, my God. No, no, I'm not doing onion rings Olympic style. Hear me out. It's like <laughs> the rings, but they're onion and they're deep fried. Oh, no, I, look, I get it. I got it. 
Get Nourished is brought to you by BioGland Platinum Probiotics, backed by science. Australia's highest strain probiotic range for digestive and immune system health. I've got a question for you, Dr. Nick Carr. At night time, should we be breathing through our nose exclusively, through our mouth, or maybe a little bit of both? <laughs> well, you're fast asleep, Darcy, so you don't get a lot of choice. But when you're really healthy, through the nose works really well, because otherwise we risk snoring. Because does everyone here snore? I've mentioned my husband before, he snores all <laughs> the time. Yeah, my husband is a shocking snorer, and I've always had the moral <laughs> high ground on that. Same. But now, I think I've started, because apparently, with age, my face has sagged. And now I'm snoring more. Good to know. <laughs> Such confronting gaze, Joe. Another question for you, Nick. That feeling of when you fall asleep and then you jerk yourself oh. awake, so what's that all about? Yeah, well, they're called hypnic or hypnagogic jerks, and they can happen to anyone. I actually get myself, and I wake my wife up in the place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, <laughs> maybe not here, Nick. But they can also be triggered by things like excess caffeine, exercise just before bedtime, sometimes stress. So they are sometimes a problem. With a lot we don't know about sleep, but obviously, but one thing I can tell you, the record for days without sleep is 11. Oh. That sounds like an absolute nightmare. Yeah, but why would you go for that sort of sleep deprivation? Because really long-term sleep deprivation is harmful, can even kill you. On that cheerful <laughs> note, that's, uh, we've got time for today. But don't forget to check out the Wellness Lift Out with influencer and entrepreneur Pia Muhlenbeck on the cover. Of course, you can always check out myself and Gerald Quigley on House of Wellness Radio every Sunday. Big thanks, as always, to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you next time.